Hello everyone and welcome to Singularity Podcast. Singularity Podcast is a feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, I am very privileged to have Professor Kevin Warwick as my guest with the answers. Kevin is a professor of cybernetics at the University of Reading, England, where he carries out research in artificial intelligence, robotics, and cyborgs. Kevin is best known, however, for his pioneering experiments involving a neurosurgical implantation into the median nerves of his left arm to link his nervous system directly to a computer, and also with the first purely electronic direct communication between the nervous system of two humans, which was, uh, which was done between him and his wife. So, hi Kevin, and welcome to Singularity Podcast. It is great to have you here today. Hi Nicola, looking forward to it. Very well. Uh, it is entirely my pleasure, Kevin. So, without further ado, let me start the interview with the following question. Kevin, can you please tell us a little bit more about yourself, such as your background and your education, but especially why and how you got interested in issues such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and the technological singularity? Yeah, I, I guess as a teenager, I was always into technology, um, building things. But I, I had a motorcycle and liked playing with it and making it go faster, that sort of thing, changing it. At the same time, I enjoyed science fiction. Um, Michael Crichton, particular, I was a particular fan of his. The Terminal Man, he wrote, um, uh, when I read that when I was a, a teenager, absolutely fantastic, I thought. Not just from a science fiction point of view, but from the point of view of science. Surely in the future, and I think a lot of Crichton's work, you tend to read it and think, surely this is going to be possible in the future. And uh, later on, uh, I got involved with robotics, little, little things, you know, little wheeled robots with ultrasonics and, uh, and moving the wheels around, and looking at how they are intelligent and how their intelligence is different to humans. Uh, so to actually experiment by linking the two things together, some of the science fiction things I'd read and the robotics and AI that I was working on, it just seemed to happen naturally. And I mean, in the academic world, there are lots of people that are trying to get you to do boring things, to write <laughs> papers that nobody ever reads. And um, I, I don't know that I wanted to live my life like that. I wanted to actually experiment. And that's something I've always enjoyed doing. A practical experimentation is something that's really important. That's very interesting because um, the reason why I decided not to continue with academics and do a PhD after my master's was uh, m similar impressions to yours. Um, I wrote that I, the way I got involved into being interested into artificial intelligence and the technological singularity was by writing a paper, my research paper for my master's degree called Hacking Destiny, Critical yeah. Security at the Intersection Between Machine and Human Intelligence. This is a plug. I know it. This is a plug. You have to, <laughs> you have to citation. No, actually, no. I'm quite. I'm quite happy with with the blog so far. <laughs> Everyone will cite it now. <laughs> uh, I wish. I wish. No, but one of the criticisms that I got then was uh, that I didn't engage very much the literature of the 70s, or mm -hmm. not sufficiently. Uh, and my argument in return was that there is an abyss of change from what was done in the 1970s until what is being done in the last decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, let me uh, refocus our discussion back on you and ask you, so what is your motivation behind your work? Is it uh, general scientific curiosity? Is it humanitarian? Is it sort of the desire to transcend biology? Or... Um, I, I think certainly scientific... Help. Yeah, certainly scientific investigation. I just want to find what's around the corner, look outside the box. There's no question about that. I think there's also a bit of pioneering spirit. Um, when I look at who are my heroes, 
uh, which would have been a good question from you, uh, it would be um, Captain Scott, the guy that went to the South Pole and got there too late, or Charles Lindbergh flying, a, you know, people like that. I, I guess John F. Kennedy and those sort of things say, so, yeah, we're going to put man on the moon. In 10 the, years. The, in a, sir, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And then to go and do it. And uh, so not only to say, let's do something and then to deliver it, but those sort of people have been my inspiration. Um, and then I wanted to try and do that in the scientific world to actually achieve something that is a little bit different, that I feel, yes, we can do this, but then to go ahead and do it has been for me. I, humanitarian is, a, I, I would say, not at all, because I do see humans as being very, very limited in what we can do. Mm. And the sooner we get into post-humanity and cyborgs and so on, I, the better, really. So I know there is a lifeboat society or something. They get try and get you to sign up that you want to save humanity. Well, I don't know that I do want to save humanity. The sooner we get <laughs> we get done with humanity and move on to something that's a little bit better, so be it. And to me, the singularity is about moving on from humanity. It's not getting humans living through the singularity as humans, but maybe getting humans living through the singularity as cyborgs. We, we come out of it as something a lot better, and we say bye-bye to humans, uh, unless there's a few of them around that still want to um, live on islands and something and don't, don't cause any problems. Mm -hmm. That's very funny, because I'm actually on the advisory board of the Lifeboat Foundation. Oh. I've just, I've just ruined everything. <laughs> no, no, I've been no. switched off. <laughs> uh, actually, we're in complete agreement. I, I, I think we agree very much about the future. So, and that's one but of I, the reasons why, I, think, why I invited I, you here today. I think there is the other aspect because I, a lot of the work I do is with surgeons. Um, mm -hmm. they, they talk a different language and it can be difficult to uh, understand what they're saying as to what's possible. Um, but it's worth the effort because I think we do have a lot of technology now available that we can use to help people. Um, so I'm all for helping the people that are around now. I, it, when somebody has Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or a stroke, it's terrible when we know, well, we have the technology. We could do a lot more for those people. And I wish there were more folk researching in the area. So there's a lot we can do, and uh, certainly I would like to do a lot more. But my main goal, I believe, is scientific investigation, looking outside the box. So let me zoom out back a little bit and, and ask you, maybe we should set the terms, because there's some disagreement among the experts about the meaning of terms such as the technological singularity or even artificial intelligence. So yes. what, in your opinion, is artificial intelligence and how is it and what is the technological singularity? Um, I'll answer the second question first. I, I mean, how I see the singularity technically, I, I think lots of people are going to have different views and opinions on it. Um, I see it as a point where uh, intelligent machines or upgraded humans, the cyborg, mm -hmm. are at a point where they make the decisions, that they are the species that then becomes the dominant species. So the time of humans of being in the driving seat, if you like, comes to an end and it is either cyborgs or intelligent machines. So in a sense, it's a bit like the Terminator scenario, as a, but for real. That's how I that's how I see it. It's a realistic thing. Um, it's very dangerous for humans if you want to stay as a human, obviously. Yeah. But if you're happy to upgrade, then um, a way to go. Uh, and I do see a, the cyborg that I'm interested in and talking about is 
one who has an intellectual upgrade. So their brain is matrix style linked into an intelligent network or they have chips plugged into it or a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the matrix style port, I think, has a lot more to offer, but that's just a matter of choice, maybe. So it's that sort of entity that is intellectually way, way above, better um, than humans that then is making all the decisions. Or it could be intelligent machines. Uh, so that's the technological singularity. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of AI, uh, yeah, what is intelligence? <laughs> um, I was just reading your book, Key, by the way. Which... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's trying to oh, that's thanks. That's, I, everybody's that's... plugging everybody's plugging you plug your master's thesis i plug it for the book as well this is great <laughs> stuff yeah. Every, everyone's switched off now with all this plug but um i mean they're trying to get to grips with what intelligence is because i think a lot of definitions of intelligence and and then ai pointing to human intelligence and particular types of human intelligence um, they forget about people with dementia. They forget about people with Alzheimer's disease. You know, these are still people. Uh, and I really feel everybody is intelligent in some way, but even cows and sheep and bats and ants are intelligent in a way that is suitable for them, that is suitable for their body. And machines are intelligent in their way. And even with AI which is like machine type intelligence, you get different types. You have a computer based system and some computers are more powerful than others. You have microprocessor based system. I showed you this little robot. The well, rat what? brain one. The rat brain, yeah. yeah. And we so we grow the brain in there. So it's a biological brain in a robot body. I would see it as a form of AI, a machine intelligence, but it's it's biological. Is it emotional? Well, it probably is, yes, if creatures are emotional. And if you just take some of the philosophers like John Searle, mm -hmm. very eminent, excellent philosopher, he talks about uh, emergent behavior. Consciousness in humans is due to the emergent nature of human neurons. If we put enough of them together, we get a conscious human. Maybe we need the body as well. What we're doing now is taking human neurons, growing them, building brains with human brain cells. So are we going to have a conscious robot? Well, according to John Searle, we are. And if that's not artificially intelligent and conscious, so I'm very open to it. I think every, even maybe like the Red Indian said, rocks and stones have a soul and are intelligent mm -hmm. well probably they do it's a very simplistic version e even a very simple switching relay is probably intelligent in a very very simplistic way just like a simple slug has about nine brain cells it's it's not going to win iq tests and things like that but it gets by as a slug it does okay and uh, for humans 100 billion is all right but if we had 600 billion or whatever, we'd be able to do a lot more thinking in a lot more complexity.